Is there a connection between air pollution and the coronavirus? Lockdowns have helped the environment as factories closed, flights were cancelled and ships slowed. Clear waters in the canals of Venice, clear skies over Delhi, you don't see that every day. But studies show poor quality air prior to the crisis could have made people more vulnerable to COVID-19. Hi, I'm Ben Fazulan. Let's look first up at what the scientific evidence says about pollution and corona fatalities. It's a map that many of us have become painfully familiar with. The red dots showing coronavirus cases around the world. The number of fatalities has been especially high in northern Italy. In Spain, around the capital Madrid, similar scenarios. This has prompted some researchers to examine the environment in these regions more closely. Among them is Jaron Orgen, a geographer at the University of Halle. All the research until this point um, was focusing on what background diseases these people that died from coronavirus has. Are they smoking? Do they have any cardiovascular diseases? Do they have diabetes? Um, but I shifted, and other researchers also from around the world started to shift it from the background diseases to the environmental factor. In his study, Yaron Ogen examined the level of air pollution measured by satellites before the outbreak. He focused on nitrogen dioxide, the gas emitted by cars, planes and industrial activity. Another factor that he was interested in concerned the geography of the regions where the number of deaths were high. I noticed a pattern um, that of, of the fatalities uh, in China, in Tehran, in, um, in the north part of Italy and in Madrid. These are places surrounded by mountains, mountain ranges and valleys. So mountains actually close the area which means if there are pollutants, uh, any kind of pollutants in this area, especially in winter when you have a very cold weather, uh, the air moves downwards, very cold, very stable conditions. The pollutants stay close to the ground, close to the surface, and the mountains do not let it spread, do not let it disperse in other places. Um, and so the population are exposed to uh, high uh, concentration of the pollutants. And there have been other studies, such as this one from Shandong University in China, which found that long-term exposure to air pollution attacks the immune system and damages the lungs. Or, more precisely, the cilia of the lungs, which make up the first line of defence against inhaled germs. That can make it much easier for pathogens like the coronavirus to advance into the airways. If the environment is clean, we will be clean and we will be healthy. But if our environment is polluted, we will suffer more. And um, that was exactly the main cause, to look at the environment. And we should keep it clean. There are, of course, multiple factors that influence how severely the coronavirus strikes. But the environment may play a bigger role than we thought. DW's Ajit Naranjan has taken a look at the studies for us. Ajit, has air pollution made us more vulnerable to catching the coronavirus or actually dying from it? So it's not about catching the virus, but more about the chances of you dying from the virus. We know that air pollution increases the risk of these underlying health conditions like lung cancer and asthma that leave your body more vulnerable in the face of infection. And scientists are worried that the more people who are exposed to long-term bad air, the more people there are in a region who will then suffer from these health conditions that lead to these complications. Uh, what about the, uh, the, the science behind this? Can the virus basically ride on particulate matter and make its way into our lungs? So we can quite strongly say that this isn't the case. Every epidemiologist and air pollution expert I spoke to said that there's basically no reason to suspect that this is happening. 
essentially the the World Health Organization has made very clear that the virus is transmitted from person to person. And this happens through droplets in the air and sometimes on the surfaces that these land on. And this is, of course, why it's so important that we all wash our hands and avoid touching our faces and that we physically distance from one another. Droplets and surfaces, words I don't like anymore. What are the takeaways here, Ajit? I think the main takeaway to know is that if you suffer from one of these underlying health conditions, if you live in one of these polluted areas and you do have these chronic conditions like asthma or, or lung disease, then yes, you are probably at higher risk of complications from the virus. What's less clear, though, is what does it mean if you live in one of these areas but don't suffer from these conditions? Could the air pollution still have an effect on your survival chances if you do contract the virus? That's something that scientists don't know yet. But what's important to consider is that hospitals which are dealing with large number of patients who do suffer from these diseases are more likely to be overwhelmed. So even if you don't have the virus, if, even if you don't have an underlying health condition, if you live in an area with high pollution, your hospitals might be more at risk. So, Ajit, what should governments be doing to ensure this doesn't happen again, that we're protected from this? I mean, post-crisis, I guess everything's going to go back to normal, at least that's my fear, and um, it's not going to be good for us or the environment. I think that's a fear of many environmental groups as well. And campaigners, medical professionals, people working in the field of air pollution are really calling for a drastic change where we don't just go back to business as usual. And obviously it's understandable that governments right now are kind of focused on limiting the spread of the disease and trying to avoid this huge disruption to the economy that the lockdowns have created. But people are also noticing the reduction in air quality that we're seeing right now and are asking how we can make this last longer. So some suggestions that maybe are, are the most obvious and basic ones are to accelerate the shift to from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources that are less polluting. So solar panels and wind farms that don't spew these gases that are actually damaging our lungs. The other big consideration is how to change transport and how to move from these um, kind of diesel and petrol based vehicles to electric vehicles or even to public transport. These are the kind of considerations that groups are trying to get governments to consider right from the very start and not leave till after the pandemic. Ajit, thanks for having you on the show. Now to your questions on the coronavirus, here's our science editor Derek Williams. The pandemic has brought cleaner water and cleaner air. Should we do lockdowns regularly to improve environmental quality? I'm not a climate scientist, but I read a riveting article by a well-known expert in that field just this morning, and it touched on this question, which is why I decided to try to answer it here. Um, she makes it very clear that although we'd all love to believe that there's some kind of environmental silver lining to this disaster that is the COVID-19 epidemic, there isn't one because CO2 lasts for so long in the atmosphere and because we've been pumping it into the atmosphere for so long, what's happening now might improve air quality temporarily, but it won't really do anything to slow the biggest factor in, in environmental quality, which is climate change. She also makes a very compelling case that going into regular lockdowns, willingly accepting the suffering and death that they also would cause, that it wouldn't solve our environmental woes. The only thing that'll do that, she says, is changing a system that's based on extracting CO2 from the ground and pumping it into the atmosphere. When a COVID-19 patient is ventilated, does the virus just die off over time? Mechanical ventilation via intubation is a very invasive last resort procedure that's only implemented when a patient's oxygen levels fall below key thresholds, when, when organ damage is imminent because not enough oxygen is reaching the bloodstream. What the machine is supposed to do is keep someone who's critically ill alive long enough to allow their immune system to clear the pathogen and fluid from their lungs to help them reach the point where normal breathing will provide enough oxygen again. 
we still don't have any medications to treat the disease. So at that point, the body's immune system either wipes the virus out and then subsides to levels where the immune reaction itself isn't lethal or the patient dies. The ventilator is a last ditch attempt to give the immune system the time it needs to take care of the infection on its own. Interestingly, attitudes towards mechanical ventilation for COVID-19 patients are shifting among experts at the moment, but, but that's another topic. Maybe I'll talk about that next week. What do post-mortem observations of the lungs in COVID-19 patients reveal? About 5% of the patients who contract COVID-19 will grow critically ill, and the symptoms that put them in intensive care pretty much always involve the lungs. Quite a few histological studies have looked at exactly what kind of damage the virus does there, and what those studies basically reveal is that a critical infection usually disrupts oxygen transfer in the lungs by causing a massive immune reaction. That leads to inflammation and creates this sludge of fluid and dead cells that block oxygen transfer even more. When things reach a critical point, patients enter what's called acute respiratory distress syndrome. Then they have to be ventilated and many die. Subsequent autopsies show that the tiny sacs in their lungs that allow gas exchange are packed with a gummy yellow fluid made up of mucus, white blood cells from the immune system, and dead cells from the lining of the lungs. <laughs>